Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. The most enjoyable place, the University of Limerick, where I can follow my hobbies of soil chemistry and sport. Now, what I have to say today is somewhat alarming, but let me point out that this does not apply to Ireland at this time, as I will show later, but the world is going to be in trouble if we don't take heed. Now, the fact is that the carbon in our soils is a huge asset. There's about 1,600 gigatons of carbon in our soils worldwide in the top meter. Now, they say that this persists to three meters, but I think what is below one meters is very much less than what is considered to be there. But what we should know is that we have four to six times more organic carbon or organic matter on the surface soils than we have in all living matter, all living matter on the surface of the earth. Now, you see, that's an enormous uh, reservoir. There's only 800 gigatons in the air, which is less than half of what there is in soil, despite the fact that we hear a great deal about that. And you should know that before the Industrial Revolution, there was 260, 270 parts per million uh, in the atmosphere. Today, there are 217 parts per million. That's a very considerable increase. But you should also know that some millions of years ago, there was very much more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You should know too that there were forests in Antarctica and that sea levels were three or four meters higher. We're moving that way, but perhaps in a couple of million years. But what we are doing now is we're accelerating this process. And this we must try to stop. Uh, now, it's predicted that modern factory farming methods, which operate in most of the soils of the world, the fertile soils, that the soil organic matter in these will be so depleted that it will be, soils will be degraded in 50 to 100 years from now. That's long after my lifetime, but well within the lifetime of very many of you, so you had better be careful. Now, also, bear in mind that there's 2.13 gigatons of carbon needed to raise the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere by one part per million. So now, if half of the uh, carbon in the top meter of soil were to be oxidized in the next 50 years, then we would have 375 parts per million additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. A lot of that, of course, would be sequestered in the oceans, but that will do no good whatsoever to the biota, the fish, and the other life in the oceans. So we have got to be very careful about what all of this. Now, the most important thing insofar as soils is concerned is soil structure. And the fertility soils, we have sand, silt, clay, and organic components. They associate in clumps. And these clumps allow pore spaces between them where air and water is uh, formed. Now, the soil organic matter is absolutely essential for the crumb or the aggregate structure. So the loss of indigenous soil carbon to the atmosphere is very serious, of course, but the degradations of the soil structure as the result of these losses is doubly serious. The clay, to a lesser extent, the sills and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the sills, but especially the soil organic matter, are, and to some extent, hydroxides, are the seeds of fertility in soils. So how are they, what are they like? Now, that's what um, the soil crumb structure like. That's not my hand, by the way. Um, that soil has got very good crumb structure, but it has got a great deal of organic matter, as you can see from the color in it. So we do desperately need that organic matter. Now the clay and the silt, uh, the clay is the most important of the inorganic colloids of minerals. 
and clay is usually these are just defined by the soil. Clay is less than two microns equivalent spherical diameter, and the silt is two to 50 microns. These are the classifications. Then you have very fine sand and so on. But all of these are in the soil, but they would be useless. I mean, they would be dispersed. But for the fact that we have soil organic matter binding them. Now, <clears throat> what about clays? I'll tell you just a little about them. There are three types of prototypes. There's montmorillonite, elitic, and uh, kaolinite. Now, I'll just do a thumbnail sketch for you of what these are. This is a Mount Rosenite structure. That is what we would call a, a two to one layer clay. Here we have a silicon oxygen tetrahedral layer. And here we have a silicon oxygen tetrahedral layer. And sandwiched in the middle, we have an aluminium hydroxide octahedral layer. The important thing is that we have a siloxane surface at the top and at the bottom in this one. And if you look down on that clay structure, you'll see a hexagonal array of oxygen atoms. Now you see, in the case of Mount Rilnite, we have what we call isomorphous substitution of magnesium for aluminium in here, in the octahedral sheet, and that gives rise to a negative charge. And that is, is dissociated to the surface, where it is pretty uniformly spread over the surface, top and bottom. And that is counterbalanced by cations. And for example, when we have calcium in there, these cations go between the layers. We have them in here in the intelomeric spaces, and these cations are hydrated. Now, um, if you look then at uh, illite clays, in these, the isomorphous substitution is in the tetrahedral layer, the silicon layer, where we have aluminium and sometimes magnesium, and the charge is distributed largely on the closest oxygen atoms to them. So we have a sine curve type, a type of distribution of charge on the surface. Now, you see, there is a very peculiar, great peculiarity about the elytic clays, and that is potassium can fit into these hexagonal holes, fit very snugly into these, and they can attract another clay particle to overlap them. So if you, if you visualize two egg cup, an egg uh, caught in an egg cup, top and bottom, you'd see what you have in the case of Elite. And that cat potassium is so tightly held that the uh, layers do not push apart. So we have a non-expandable clay lattice. In the case of uh, kaolinite, which is very, very widely dispersed and is the source of very considerable clay industries, in that we merely have a silicon oxygen layer and that aluminium hydroxide, no second silicon layer. So it is what we call a 1-1 one -one layer, and there's very little isomorphous substitution. So because we have the fact of hydroxides bonding onto oxygens, we have very strong hydrogen bonding. So the clays build up in huge numbers of structures. So we have uh, a fairly unreactive in a sense, in terms of soil fertility clay, but a very, very useful clay in so far as fillings, paper fillings, in so far as ceramics, and so far as numerous industrial processes are concerned. Now, the fact though is, and um, all of this is just what I've said, so I can, if you, for those who are especially interested, can read that. We were very interested in clays in Birmingham, particularly in the interaction of uh, organic chemicals with them. We worked out the mechanisms of numerous anthropogenic organic chemicals with clays. But we were particularly interested with Keith Ross. Now, Keith was Julian's brother. And he is a, was, sadly, he left us a couple of years ago. He was <clears throat> a very distinguished, what we call, neutron scatterer. And he got interested in our clays, and he was interested in the dynamics of the water associated with the cations in the lamellar spaces. And we were actually able to work out the dynamics and the structure of two layers of water between the mountain and night when that water was associated with calcium. 
Now, uh, when I tell you about the uh, glue, the organic matter is the glue that holds all of these particles together. And I'll try to get later on to how I think it does that. Now, the emissions from soil present, as I said before, a far greater threat to our existence than global warming, because one of the things that we desperately need is food. And if we can't feed a population of almost 10 billion by 2050, we're in serious trouble. Now, the fact is this, that the great soils of the world are producing, going to a long-term cultivation. They're growing crops such as maize, soybeans and so on, year after year after year. And all they're adding to the soil is a minimum fertilizer. The organic matter is being degraded and the soils are being degraded. So uh, the thing is, is that when we have a soil that's in long-term grassland as we have in Ireland, we reach a steady stage where we have the organic matter is about five, six percent, maybe seven percent. But you see, if we keep continuously cultivating that soil, it also reaches a steady state at the lower level and where the organic matter is very much less. So we start out here with soil seeing continuous grassland. We, um, we, we uh, cultivate it continuously for 50 years and so on. We get to a second steady state, in which case the soil is being greatly eroded. If we plant grass back again, we slowly get back to where we were, but that takes a long, long time. So of course, what we must do is not let that happen. Now, it is important uh, to be aware of the contents and the compositions of the organic carbon in soil organic matter. This is very important for us to know in terms of practical uh, functionalities and in terms of the chemistry. But we should also know that the, remember there's 2.13 gigatons of carbon in uh, gives rise to one part per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So if we only let 15% of the organic matter decrease in the next 50 or so years, we'll be increasing the atmospheric level by 60 parts per million. We must not let any carbon get lost from our soils. So we have to stop the oxidation of what we call the indigenous organic material. Now, there's a lot of emphasis on eliminating carbon dioxide from fossil fuels, and rightly so. But look, that is trivial in comparison to what will happen if we don't stop emissions of indigenous carbon from the soil. There is no real emphasis being given to that at this time. Now, Ratton Lyle followed me in Ohio State. Ratton, um, I guess he's maybe a Hindu, but he was kicked out of Pakistan when, at the time when India and Pakistan uh, were separated. <coughs> and they were given a hectare of land in uh, the Pan Punjab, and that's not much land, you know. But Ratan was a bright guy, and he uh, studied, got scholarships, and came to succeed me at Ohio State. Well, what Ratan has done, uh, those who say he hasn't done a great deal of fundamental work, but he has done very much more. He has raised awareness. He has had uh, articles in science in all the leading journals pointing out in a very simple, no minded way how important it is that we return crop residues to the soil. Look, he has a Google Scholar H index of 170 and an amazing I 10x of 1050. There's nobody in Ireland can match that. Uh, he, um, he, some say he has a considerable conceit of himself. I consider he deserves it, and I found him to be quite personable and okay, and so far as I'm concerned. Now, let us consider what we need to know about soil organic matter in order to impede the degradation I'm talking about. Now, soil organic 
matter, the term encounters all of the organic matter in the soil. But that would be useless except for the microorganisms that transport it and transfer it, transpose it into the organic matter, which is useful. When I was a student, they said there are more microorganisms in a thimble full of soil than there are all of the people in China. Now, there's a lot more people in China and nearly as many in India at this time. And at those distant days, they had famines in China and had famines in India. Now they're producing enough food quite conservatively in these countries to feed their populations. Also, in their soils, there are at least as many soil, uh, microorganisms in the ground as there are people in these countries. So the organic matter do transform the materials into carbon dioxide and water, but more important, they're transformed into the humus materials. Uh, and the humus materials is what is so vital in our soils. Now, these are two of my early students. One is Roger Swift, who has been here many times. Roger, um, he ended up as uh, the executive dean of agriculture and veterinary medicine uh, at the University of Queensland, which is in the top 50 in the world. John Stanley, after he left me, he went decided, look, there's something I must do for the tropical soils of the world because the people need to know more about them. So he went to the University of Queensland where they had a program on tropical agriculture. When he graduated from there, they thought this guy was so good that we'll put him in our tropical soils and he stayed there since. Now, what he did is amazing. You see, the tropical soils are very rich in aluminium hydroxides and in iron hydroxides, and these lock the phosphate. And the phosphate in these soils is relatively unavailable to plants, but he has worked on these. He has learned a great deal about it. He has been decorated numerous times for the work that he has done on the release of phosphate from tropical soils. Now, <clears throat> Roger and I, uh, I published a couple of very good texts on soil chemistry by Dennis Greenland, uh, who was uh, then at the University of Birmingham. So we uh, cl classified uh, organic matter as one unaltered material, includes fresh debris, uh, and all transforming organic matter. And two, the transformed are the humus and the humic substances. Now, of course, these are the most important. But we then divided the humic substances into amorphous humic substances and humins. But I still would not put hum we would not put humins among these humic substances anymore. But two, very, very important are compounds that belong to recognizable classes. We don't, we call these components of like polysaccharides, polypeptides, lignans. We call these components of humus, but not humic substances. They are readily, well, more readily degrade in the soil environment than the amorphous ones. Now, five years ago, the human, I will discuss that later, it's very important. Dennis Greenland. Uh, he's the one who did these books with me. He got a first in chemistry at Oxford. He ended up as the director of research at the Rice Research Institute after he had left Reading. When he was doing chemistry at Oxford, there were two ladies only in the course. One was a nun and the other was Margaret Thatcher. Now he said the nun was by far the most sociable of the two and by far a better student. <laughs> But uh, I wasn't there then. Now, Dennis left us about eight years ago. He was a very good chemist, there's no doubt. Now, <clears throat> but the late 19, December 2015, there was an absolute storm of upset in the whole humic field. Two displaced Germans, one Jochen Lehmann, who made his name and very considerable reputation on biochar. And the other fellow was Kleber. Lehmann is at Cornell. Kleber is, Kleber is at the uh, Oregon State University. And they said, so like Anik Matter, there's no such thing as a human substance. It's just a continuum separating a full range of materials from the intact 
plant to the carbon in uh, oxidized carbon and carboxylic acids. There's no seed in the continuum, leaves no room whatsoever for the humic materials, which are so vital insofar as soil is concerned, so far as soil structure and soil fertility is concerned. Now, Roger and I were both past presidents of the International Humic Substance Society, and we were asked, Look, will you take on these fellows? We said, with great pleasure. So anyhow, we did, and uh, we were very concerned by the erroneous assumptions and misinterpretations of those guys, by the failure to work site work that run counter to their arguments. We were concerned also about the impact they had on the young people in the field. They have received 1,700 citations. We did feel that we had to do something. So we did produce an article called Vindication of Humic Substances as Key Components of Organic Matter. And that has been published uh, fairly recently and it's doing all right. But you see, what we did was um, <clears throat> we did point out that uh, they also pointed out that it's all organic matter. They said, look, at, it is an artifact of the way it is extracted. It is taken out by alkaline extract, which alter the structure and render a fictitiously uh, reactive material. Now, what they cited for this was work by Waxman, who won the Nobel Prize for streptomycin in the 30s. And I'll point out that Waxman might have been pretty good at that, but by heck, he misled the world, as I'll show you later on, insofar as humans are concerned. But look, it doesn't matter. If you win the Nobel Prize, you can say anything, and people will believe you. But um, also, they said that, they said that, look, organic matter, that they, uh, the methods they use extracts only 50 to 70 percent of the organic matter, leaving the rest as human material. Well, the fact is that they weren't really up to date. They ignore the work of Swift and Posner, two really good guys in 1973 who sold that you did not have any oxidation of soil humic material when you did the extractions in dilute base in an atmosphere of the nitrogen gas and in the absence of light. And also, they weren't familiar with the work that we had done here, in which we showed that up to 95% of the soil organic matter could be isolated as either humic components or as humid. So we had legitimate grounds to attack them. And we well, it was no pleasure, but it was satisfaction to be able to show around the world. Now, we agree that it is, a, they, they criticize the fact that you, you know, that you, it's pointless extracting it. You should just study it in local. Well, look, where would we be in the biological sciences without the ability to isolate proteins, nucleic acids, and so on? So we pointed out this to them. You've got to be able to extract essential components and know what they are made of. So we have gone through that. Now, these are two of my heroes who did so much on the extraction. This fellow is a UL graduate, Tom Hayes. He happens to be my nephew, but that's irrelevant. Uh, Simon Quixang, also a young graduate. 2008, he's now a professor in a Chinese university. And you see, we had the idea, we've got to back in Tom's time in the 1990s, we've got to do a fractionation of the humic substances. And we have got to start by fractionating on the basis of charge density. This we did. So we had to try and uh, we, we did extract the, what we call, based on solubility differences, the humic forward and uh, materials, and we were able to fractionate these to a very, very considerable extent. And later here in Limerick, we were able to extract magnificently well what we call the human material. We were able to use a combination of polymethyl with aquilate and styrene to vinyl benzene to give very fine fractionations of the human material. 
these they came, this is a tip we had from Ron Malcolm and Pat McCarthy, who was a Galway graduate and now at the Colorado School of Mind. So we have done a lot of work on fractionation, I can't say. Come on, come down here. Um, yeah, we got it. Now, humane, they want people who are able to isolate humane. We succeeded in doing it here. We did it with um, using 94% DMSO and 6% conch sulfuric acid and by putting that into water after we had totally extracted with aqueous solvents including urea which nobody else had put in but urea breaks the hydrogen bonds that kept the most uh, recalcitrant humic materials in the soil but by adding urea we were able to get all of that out and then what was left was just plain simple uh, humin and this we here were able to to do that is the extraction procedure. I will leave it there for those who are interested in seeing it. There's no point in going through it now. But um, in case anybody is interested, they can certainly do it. Uh, this thing here is giving me a bit of trouble. I have it. I got it. I got it. Now, look, at. I won't bother you with this. But these are the numerous fractions of the humic materials we've been able to get. And thanks to NMR, we were able to show significant differences. You have to look through each of those and look at the difference between them. There are subtle differences, except in this one. If you look at um, that fellow up at the top. Uh, come on, Red, red Arrow. You see, I'll, oh yeah. it's not being up there. Hmm? Well, I'll tell you. Now, this is a, a humic acid, a nice humic acid. And you'll see the thing is, is that it has a lot of components that we are able to identify in that. And for those, again, I, uh, it's got it now. Yeah, just keep it in there. Oh, can I keep it in there? Okay. Oh yeah, for those uh, who are there, uh, I'll go through that we have, and uh, we can identify a huge amount of very relevant. The thing about this humic acid is that it's an Irish humic acid that isn't highly humified, what Craig Brown puts out. How do we know that? Because here we have methoxyl, uh, here that's OCH3, and here we have uh, O-methoxyl, O-aromatic, which is signs of lignin and the lignin is a very great component of this and we have carboxylic acids of course so uh, that's that but now the monosol soil is among the most fertile soils in the world and the humic acid in that was extraordinary and look at the comparison with the humic acid in that and that so you see, there's this guy, I'll talk about him later, Andrew Simpson, who was the last of my research students in Birmingham. He knows a brilliant uh, uh, NMR expert at the University of Toronto of Chemistry, where he's a professor. And when he came here, we decided to extract the molecule, which is the standard of the HSS. And we got this out at the lower pHs. We extracted exhaustively and then went to the higher pHs where the less, char less charged materials were, and we got a humic acid. It was more like this. But this one here had something in it. We just didn't know what the heck it was. But look at the humin and that. Humin is totally different. The humin is almost entirely aliphatic, a little bit of carbohydrate, a little bit of aromatic, and some carboxyl. Now that human, which contains, which is 50, perhaps 30 to 50 percent of the soil organic matter, is extremely hydrophobic. It absorbs very strongly to the clays. It'll stick to anything because it's hydrophobic. These, on the other hand, will not. They have to have a cation, a calcium, a cation bridge between them and the clays, for example. But this sticks wonderfully well to clay. 
Now, the fact is this, that we have been able to resolve the structure, if you mean here, and I'll explain later on who it was that did that. We said, what the heck is this? Well, JJ and uh, Brito got us into looking at biochar. And we looked at what we call the terra soils. Now, terra in the Amazon region, highly infertile soils, the small trees are all right. That's corn grown, maize grown, and that. that's very good. This is main grows in the terra and that is the black terra soil. And you see, the clever pre-Columbian Indians used to burn wood and the refuse and so on, put it into the soil, and they became black like that, full of this um, uh, rich uh, biochar material. So then you see, thanks to the promptings given, oh yeah, there was this fellow Danny Day uh, in um, Georgia, and the Georgian cells are not too different from the Amazonian ones. And this was maize going there, it wasn't doing very well. But here's where ordinary charcoal did better. But here's where charcoal from peanut shells, which is a lot of peanuts in Georgia, magnificent. Now, why did that this do so much better than this? Well, we were able to show here in the work that we have done with Miss Cantus. Uh, this is where we told and I and JJ came into the thing. This is Miss, Miss, uh, this is just maize grown in soil. Here we have it fantastically growing after 28 days where we had our miscanthus. Now, you see, what we learn from this is that the miscanthus had a magnificent pore structure. And if you had no pores in it, if you had a glassy kind of jar, it's useless. But what happens is that the microorganisms live within the pores. They form a symbiotic relationship with the plant. And it's the microorganisms and some of the minerals that are associated with the biochar that give this fantastic growth. Now look at this limerick. Andre spent a month with us before he went off to America to work at Ohio State is a postdoc. This is Rosaline, a great, great student, uh, played football for Mayo, great athlete. And here's uh, Edwina Novotny, who is a postdoc with us and who uh, introduced us to the Terra Preta soils of the Amazon region. And these people had a great deal to do with our resolving of the structures of human. Uh, I still work very much with Andre and with Edelvino and of course with Roger Swift. You never, and this, no, what, this is rather interesting. Here are three uh, human materials, one from the Amazon, one from Ireland, the human, and, uh, and by two different methods. And they're pretty well identical. Uh, and you see, the fact is this, it caused us to say, is human the same everywhere? And we think it is because it's largely derived from cutaneous material, waxy, cutins, cutan, suberin, suberant, that strongly adsorb to the clays. Now, how they get there, because they're soily insoluble, we still have to resolve. But now, you see, one of the things that these fellows live in terms of forget about uh, the idea that you have any materials are formed by chemical um, uh, synthesis in the soil. There isn't enough concentration of anything in the soil environment to give a reaction. Now, I would long since in the beginning, I said, look, there's got to be chemical synthesis. So there have been some very good fellows called Maynard and Mendes who have shown that you get a browning reaction between glucose and glycine, and enders cut it between methyl glycine and glycine. They gave brown materials that were very similar to humic materials. Now, you see, here's methyl glycine, the reaction between uh, glycine and this is uh, pyruvaldehyde, which is a forerunner of pyruvic acid. And as you know, pyruvic acid is the 
uh, it's the um, what we call it's the um, predecessor to the, to the Krebs cycle. They call it the they have a special name for it, the or oh, something in metabolism. Uh, and the fact is that this precedes this, but this is so reactive that it doesn't last for very long. But then Enders had shown that actually, if you look at it in the soil, it does exist in the soil. So then I said, if that is so, and then when I carried out the reactions, my goodness, the reaction between that and glycine was so rapid, it got colored immediately. Uh, one of the people at Ohio State saw this thing going and he had the director of um, sport there had uh, a candidate back about 57, 58 with the Heisman Trophy, which is for the top quarterback in collegiate football. He says, look, can we have this chemical engineer? Can we have him uh, come to your lab and show him doing an experiment? Look, I said, sure. So the Dick, the that's a chemical engineer, put him in a white coat, put him at my thing and the cameras, NBC were filming, nice showing him what to do. When he was going fine and then he stopped the cock, the, the browning reaction product jumped out at him, destroyed, he completely covered his beautiful lab coat. Well, the NBC censored that out because they shouldn't show a Heisman Trophy candidate dropping a pass in the football field or dropping an experiment in the lab, you see. So, but I was coast to coast, coast to coast, nothing. Now, the fact though is, if we go back, that what we have to say is that the, the when I was uh, at Ohio State, we had access to differential thermal analysis. And it showed that they were pretty identical to the uh, humic acid, the one from uh, 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 from uh, from methyl dioxyl. But you know, um, we needed any more, which we didn't have it. Now Waxman said, Waxman said, look, for simple. So cell organic humics are simple. They're just a lignoprotein complex. Well, my um, supervisor at Cornell said, oh, nobody's ever isolated a protein from the soil. I went to Ohio State and we had better, more equipment. I said, well, look at that. So we did exactly what Waxman did. We, do, we took his um, oxidized lignin and did a DTA on it. Uh, we took uh, an oxidized, uh, we took a uh, 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 protein and we did the mixture and we found that it was actually just a mixture of the two. There was not, a, by any means you could not say it was a lignoprotein complex that had any relevance to the soil environment. So as I said, Waxman did win the Nobel Prize, although his uh, research student uh, said that it was he who actually did the discovery, but then you know, uh, the supervisor takes all the acclaim. So anyhow, um, can we prevent the degradation of organic matter? Yes, we can. We know what the uh, compositions are, and we don't, don't know any detail, but we know the reactive functional groups that are in there. We know how they react. We know how we can get them to uh, react with the clays and other materials in the soil environment. We know that we've got to make sure that these organic matters don't be degraded. But one of the things that we must do is, we must remember what happened in Mesopotamia, with the cradle of civilization, where we had supposedly four million people in the Tigris and Euphrates between the rivers, very, very fertile soils, irrigated. Then they blamed uh, the vandals for coming in and disrupting the population. What the vandals did was to destroy the irrigation systems and soil organic matter became depleted. The soils became desertified, desertified and the population either died or disbanded. So therefore the message is this, whatever 
we take from the soil. This is Greenland and I said back in our books two generations ago. Everything that comes from the soil that isn't used for food or for, uh, for fiber must go back to the soil. That's not being done. Now you see, you, this whatever the thing is this, the sewage sludge must go back. JJ has got a great deal. He's pretty good. I must say JJ is pretty good on paralysis kind of things. And he has a new technique of uh, hydroprolysis. And this is going to be a fantastic way for converting any material that into what is something that can be added to the soil. And so sewage sludge can be totally safely added to the soil by using JJ's procedure. Will people listen? Well, it's up to JJ to show. Now, there's one other thing, you know. What about chemists? This fellow, Alessandro Piccolo, he and I are good friends, and I did a sabbatical of three months with him in 98. What he has done very recently, he has taken a porphyrin structure. He has essentially added it to a soil at the same concentrations as you would um, pesticide. Very low concentrations. And what he has found has been amazing. And that is that the aggregates were rendered uh, safe from biodegradation. That what it did effective, effectively is to cause the humic materials to undergo a polymerization process to begin super large molecules. We know the functionalities, this is what the chemistry has done for us, that can do that. Piccolo thinks he knows the, how the um, porphyrin structures work. I think he needs to do a great deal more to convince us. But the fact is that this is just the beginning. And you see, if chemists really get to work on it, perhaps we can save the humic substances from degradation. Also, there's no doubt about it. If we put back all of the organic matter we take out, and, and regard no such thing as an organic waste, as something go back to the soil, applying that principle and applying chemistry, look, we will have no problem, but, but it'll cost a bit more to produce food doing that. It costs a bit more, but not much more. And the factory farmers will go out of business, and that's all right. But let us say that there is no need for what they are doing, and civilization can't afford it. So then, what, as I said, the last message is this. What is needed? Well, we need widespread awareness of the problems we face. We need numerous Thornbergs, young men, young women, to spread the message. Let me say this, that this doesn't apply to Ireland because most of our soils are in grassland. They're not in long-term cultivation. But we've got to still get young people with enthusiasm to go into solving this problem for us in two generations' time or for the rest of the world. Now, food security in 30, 50 years can be accomplished if we take action now. So now is the time to begin. We needed the national funding and the scale for global warming. It is more serious, I say, than global warming. And we need energetic insiders from UL and elsewhere to carry the message. So thank you, gentlemen. And ladies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I'm going to hand over to Matteo. Would you just talk here? Uh, we said the cost of, uh, you mentioned the cost of fertilizing soil, and you know, you showed the example of uh, the Italian guy with porphyry. Now, porphyry is quite expensive. There's a, yeah. uh, is there like a target cost compared to the normal fertilizer? Yes, uh, the, the target cost is be, would should be that is no more expensive than applying a, her a herbicide. Mm. This is the thing. Yeah. Now, the amount that he has used is something about a kilogram per hectare had this yeah. enormous effect. Mm. So you see, that is just the beginning. Mm. Porphyrin is just a start. There's no reason 
why we can't get other types of functionalities to do it. This is only at the beginning, but it's got to be pursued. There's got to be money put into it in the same way as it's put into many other things to find better ways. Uh, you know, they have to put, the chemical industry should really put as much money into this as they are into getting new pesticides or new biocides. Uh, yeah, I was just speaking yesterday, they launched the, uh, the, the largest uh, plant for CO2 uh, sequestration in Iceland. And the cost there is about a thousand euros per ton of CO2. Uh, yeah, look, 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 something we forget. We have about 417 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We have 260 and then, well, uh, before the industry. If we didn't have that much, carbon dioxide as we have now in the atmosphere. If we did, if we were back at 18, whenever it was, mm -hmm. the pre-industrial revolution, we'd be starving because we need that carbon, that additional carbon dioxide to enhance the photosynthesis that we need to provide the food we have. So the thing is this, I will not be worried if we left the CO2 in the atmosphere. The thing is this, that if we can go up to 500 parts per million, that's about as far as we can go. But we need not even go that far. If we make sure that our indigenous soil organic matter, and if we cut out, if we if we begin electrical electricity for cars and so on, instead of fossil fuels, we can do it easily. There isn't a problem with that. We just have to give it the emphasis it deserves. Okay, uh, I don't know if there's any question from the audience. Uh, there isn't, so uh, I thank again Mike and thank again everyone who was here in the first um, talk of this new series. Hope this takes place and uh, becomes more and more successful and that we can take we can return in having these lectures in presence with a coffee afterward because it would be a nice um, opportunity to discuss with us. And the next uh, next Friday we'll have two speakers, and there will be uh, uh, Ursel uh, Bangert, and there will be Sharazad uh, Dagigi giving a talk to the banal and the details will be uh, communicated during the week and uh, with these i thank everyone and uh, yeah bye everyone okay how we we kept the time yeah it's uh, the time, the time, the time, the time, the time.